Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a very special edition of 15 Minutes of Thought. And what I want to do is I'm teaching this from a different format. I'm actually teaching this from Zoom, okay, and just recording it to my computer and sending it through. So something that we're doing a lot of, especially in this sort of COVID era, is we're doing a lot more teaching online. And so what I want to do is I want to give you some ideas as to things that you can do that will make you a little bit more effective. So this is five rules, JD's rules, for teaching effectively online. And you can take them with a grain of salt, but these are things that I've either observed in others as they've been teaching online. You know, there's so many people teaching. And, um, and also in my own teaching that I want to get better. Right, on top of the 15 minutes of, uh, of thought that I do each week, um, I also teach uh, an open class on Sunday, for example, it's over Zoom. And then I teach another probably four or so classes during the, during the week as well, all in a live format. So these are just sort of five principles, and I'm going to have to run up and check my notes each time that, that sort of occur to me. So let's get started. Okay. Oops. Good. So number one. The key thing is think about the perspectives of your students. You are surrounded by or enclosed effectively in a virtual box, right? One of the reasons I use this, I use this particular video on a camera. It's, um, it's oh, sorry, on a computer. It allows me this, this sort of perspective. But one thing that I encourage you to do is if you're going to teach online is put markings on the floor. For example, when I'm teaching the, the sort of image that I have here, one gives students a frame of reference, but what it also does, it sort of lets me know my parameters. I know if I go too much further forward from that mark, that my forehead's gonna be cut off or my feet are gonna be cut off. You don't wanna teach from this perspective here, right? You want it where they can see your entire body, right? They wanna be able to see where your feet are, where your angles are and so forth. So that's the first piece is remember what the box is and what the parameters are. For me, fortunately, my camera goes all the way to my walls either side, so I know pretty much exactly how far I can go and still be in the shot. The other thing to remember, and so the easiest way to mark out where that is, is mark out where the floors are. In my old dojo, you never saw it, but I had tape actually spread out, so I knew exactly how far I could step. The second thing you want to think about is you, you can also use the camera to illustrate interesting points. So for example, if I'm here in Zenkutz and I'm talking about Gyaku Hamai, right? And I wanna talk about that difference of how my upper body remains in this position, but my lower body as the piece is changing, I can use the angle of the camera here to sort of like switch, right? So am I in, if I go eh, yeah, 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 yeah. Am I in Gyaku Hamai or am I in normal Zenkutz? Am I in normal Zenkuts or am I in Gyaku Hamai? And you can use the, the video effectively to teach those kinds of things, right? You can use that, that sort of lack of focus or uh, to perspective to get them to think about particular angles, particular hand positions to zoom in and knowing where that camera is allows you to do that. So that's number one, use the box that you're given effectively. The second rule that I've got is remember that the students are only going to be looking at the TV. So unlike in a real life 3D environment where there are people around them and they can take visual cues off the people around them, that's not often the case in Zoom. So if I'm teaching, for example, and I'm teaching something here, they can't see what I'm doing, right? I have to be able to adapt to teach in both a variety of angles to help them think about that. Well, that's one part. But let's say that we're teaching here in Shodan, right? So we're here, everything's clear, it's the mirroring teaching, this is what they use for yeah, 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 right, I get to here, yeah, here, yeah, and then I'm explaining these moves. Well, if you notice, if my participants were following me, guess what? Their backs would be to me. So if I turn and look at the camera, this is probably what I would see. They're all trying to see me and look at me. It's better to bring them out and practice that second part so that they're constantly facing you, facing the TV, right? So as you teach a cut, so no matter what it is, if it has turns where it turns one way and then you do stuff, and then it turns the other way and you're teaching stuff, always bear in mind the perspective of the people you're teaching, not what yours is. And that's really important as an instructor. Think about the students. 
when I was in writing class in college, the, the one thing that I really got out of that writing class was not necessarily how to write, but for me to understand my audience. And when you're teaching over Zoom, I think understanding what the audience's perspective is, is critically important. Let's move on to sort of 2B because it's along that same line. The second thing for me as an instructor, I look so much at these, you lose the, the, the fact, the, the, the idea of depth and a camera. So when I look at stances, for example, here, right, they can look freaking awful. They can look awful, right? But they're still correct, they're in shape. The camera angle, oh, that looks better. Oh my goodness, that looks more in shape. Remembering that this angle here might not necessarily look overly flattering. Remember this angle here or this angle here might not look overly flattering. My stance looks short. If you look at it in this angle, we're now given it some depth. Oh, it is actually a long stance. Oh, look, that is actually in the correct position. So remembering those angles in the camera with the idea that it hasn't got that same depth that you're used to seeing in the real world can be really important. So as an instructor, play with the angles that you're teaching at to allow the students to get the full sense of what you're doing. Nice and easy, right? Let's have a look at number three. So the other thing as well is that when you're, at least I found this, when I started teaching online, I found that um, even though I train with students when I'm in the room with them, I found that there were these like awkward moments of silence on Zoom. Because I wasn't in a room, I feed off my students. It's normally interaction, even if it's non-verbal communication. This, you're looking at a bunch of Hollywood squares, and then even on Facebook Live, it's even worse, right? You're sitting there and you're in a room by yourself and uh, there's no one there, or there is somebody, but there's a hundred people staring at you. It's just you don't have that sort of that warmth of feedback back. And so what you want to think about is what you find is that you tend to start to train at your pace for you. So what that might do is that then I'm just ripping sort of bang, 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 bang. And what happens is that it ends up being a training session for me rather than a training session for my students. So something that I've done sort of more recently, and this is following some things that I've got off my good friends, Scott Langley and Matt Payne, is the idea of simply taking a two minute break. So allowing me to say, okay, after I've demonstrated and ran through the technique, say, okay, from here, you've got two minutes, go ahead and work on this yourself. And what that does is that, and give them specific instructions, specific directions, and let them go to it. So allow them the time to basically catch up and work on the little pieces that they need to work on. This is the equivalent of you walking around the room. And what I try to do within that sort of space of time is I'll look at the Hollywood squares and I'll provide individual feedback in that time. And what this does is that replicates what we see in the classroom. So don't be afraid to actually do that, to actually have those sort of two minutes of awkward silence, right? Because, and just provide clear instructions for what those, what those students want to do, rather than just ripping stuff out at your pace. Right, making it about you rather than your students. So allow that two minutes and you find that that can be especially effective. If you give them two minutes and say, make it in your mind as the instructor, I'm gonna pick out at least two people in the room. And probably what's happening, as every university professor says, at least eight other people in the room probably have the same question. So give them that time. Don't feel like you have to train constantly the whole time. Facebook Live, a little bit of a different story because it's just you isolated. But when you're in a Zoom class, take that time to give feedback and balance it between the parts that you're training in to provide demonstration and feedback to, to provide that. And, um, and also don't be afraid to spotlight on a really good student who's doing it and drilling it out while you provide feedback as well. Make sure you get their permission first. But this can also be particularly effective, which again frees you up to then help each individual student in the class. Something that's really important in the academic world is the idea of not plagiarizing. As we're in Zoom, in a Zoom world, and while we've got so many, um, so much information available to us, and so many of us are teaching online, something that I think is critically important is the idea 
of, of making sure you're clear where you get your sources from. And I think this is just really important. Um, it's not name dropping. It's not being, oh, look, I trained with this person or that person. It's simply citing where you got a particular idea from. Um, some, some instructors that I really respect um, have, have sort of comments to me in private that they're so tired of hearing their words come out of other people's mouths and nobody credits them with their thought process. So for me, something I do, and this is the academic in me, is I'm always, I always try to be very clear where I've heard something from, right? If something's not my idea, this is, this is where I got it from. And then this interlays into my thinking and then where I expand it from, right? And so as I go through, as I teach, I always try to illustrate where I got an idea from and then where they stopped and then I began in terms of my own thinking, right? And I think that's just really important because one, I'm probably wrong as I usually am, right? So you know that where the part, where the, the credible source sort of came from and then you know where my stuff's coming from. Um, you can make that distinction, right? So that you're not saying that somebody really important said this when it wasn't, it was actually out of my head. But two, you know where it came from and it's good providing that credit back to that person. We, we can only see to the horizon based on what we learned off our instructors, right? And so being, giving them the credit and showing where that is allows people to go back in video footage to see that. So a good example of this, we are training Shinte the other day, we're talking about this, this piece where you either put it to the center of the hand or over. Um, Robin Riley, for example, told me you, you put this over. Um, we know that sort of according to most sources, it's here in the center. So I'm like, where does that come from? I didn't know, I knew that since they Riley had said this, we talked about possible reasons why. And then um, what happened was some friends in England who were in the class with me, then went off and showed me some other videos that are on the web showing me, oh, this is this other person. I realized that since I Riley had trained with since Anoida in the UK or in, when Anoida was in America. And so we were able to build that lineage and see where the origins of this piece came from versus this and start to sort of think through that. So you can, by giving your sources, it allows people to experiment or look further into where they're thinking. So let's just go through those five, and I have even I even have notes this time. This never happens. So let's just go through those five rules. Number one, think about perspective of the students, right? Think about where they are. That's really important. And use the box that you have. The second one, right, was remember that you're on a 2D or 3D surface. Remember those angles, right? Remember where you stand in perspective of the camera, right? And how you can make effective use, use of that. Give the students time to digest and work on what they're doing and work out clever ways to give them active feedback. And the last one, cite the sources, right? Bio 101, right? Or genetics 101, any kind of, any kind of college 101, cite your sources and show where your research ends and where that comes from and where your ideas begin and never state them as fact state them as being yours and keep humble right we're all learning so with that i hope you guys find this useful um it's something that's sort of been kicking around my head there may be a part two as we carry on i'm still learning at zoom considerably as i think many of us are so with that have an awesome day look forward to seeing you soon hey Bus.